welcome to this panel discussion in commemoration of Emancipation 2023. My name is Natalie Jolifanis, and it is a real pleasure to be here among four distinguished scholars and professionals who are here to elevate this discussion on emancipation for 2023 under the theme, Enkindling Our Consciousness. So I expect some real heat in here as they ignite our consciousness. And it, let me just introduce our four panelists. Today, we are going to take that theme and we are going to focus on the town of Viewfort. And we all know what has been happening here. But we want to look at how our history, how historically Viewfort has come to be where it is today. So our topic today is history of land and property ownership in St. Lucia and implications for development with particular reference to Viewfort. And joining me in this discussion today uh, are four gentlemen. I seem to be the only lady here this, uh, this today, but it's my pleasure to have them with us. And I am going to start to my immediate right with Dr. Ras, Dr. Wayne. He is a Caribbean brother, a historian by profession, who lectures in African diaspora history at Morgan State. Welcome. Give thanks. Give thanks. And also joining us next to him is Dr. Anderson Reynolds, who I think needs no introduction, born and raised in Viewfort. So he's going to give us that perspective that we need. He resides in Viewfort. He holds a PhD in food and resource economics from the University of Florida. Dr. Reynolds is an author, a national best-selling author, and he's written a number of books in St. Lucia, and he is an authority on the socioeconomic history of St. Lucia and Viewfort in particular. Next to Dr. Reynolds, we have Dr. Winston Fulgens, who himself is a historical anthropologist. He's at the South Louis Community College in the role of vice principal of academics. He too is qualified academically in history from the University of, West, of the West Indies, anthropology from the University of Florida, and he was also a Fulbright scholar. And he focused on Caribbean prehistory and heritage management, and his PhD is in archeology. span And our final guest also needs no introduction. He is well known as a, a CMO for a very long time and as our only resident pathologist too for a number of decades. Dr. Stephen King, though is an advocate, um, advocates for the disadvantaged and he's been doing a number of things in St. Lucia. He's one of the architects in Rise St. Lucia and he's currently all over the island and in Viewfort um, helping to alleviate the problems there. So gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and it's a very, very special welcome to you. Welcome gentlemen, I, I expect uh, to hear us. The same motion, yeah, I need to hear your voice. Yes. Great, so the solution population is waiting to hear from you. I want to start off by thinking about the theme, the, the overall theme for, for this year's commemoration of emancipation and to hear your thoughts on how we can enkindle consciousness. And I want you to do that in the context of what is happening in, in Viewfort now. So just in about a minute, can you just share your thoughts on, on that theme? And I'll start with you, Raspberry. Well, give thanks and uh, blessed love to the St. Lucia family. Certainly, I am no authority on St. Lucia or Viewfort, but having been in St. Lucia, having worked and uh, volunteered through work in St. Lucia, I've seen the dynamic energy of Viewfort, uh, and in fact, most recently, been part of a project called the Seeds Project, which is a restorative justice uh, and, and peace initiative to ensure that the residents of Viewfort uh, uh, have the ability, the capacity, the capability to live and, and, and function in peace. And there was a spike in violence. So we've seen some of these dynamic things, but it, it doesn't speak to the history. And I'm very sure that the ones who are most um, familiar with that history will unpack that but I certainly have my two cents to share, and I'm very happy to do the, that at the appropriate time. So, Dr. Thank Anderson. You. Dr. Anderson. <laughs> yeah, well, when I think of um, emancipation, 
not come to my knees, repairing the damage, the psychological damage wrought by, by slavery. And, and one clear way to do that is education, more specifically, and as the Prime Minister promised, the teaching of African and St. Richard history throughout our school system. This is very important because most times our history starts with slavery, but who, who wants to be a slave? Who is proud to be a slave? If we can start our history with a history of the African civilizations, the Zimbabwe, the great African civilizations, um, I'm talking about Egypt, the building of pyramids. If we can um, start the history there, so by the time we get to slavery, we would have already built up the, the you know, our people and so forth. So also, the, the way, it's like slavery has become defined in terms of black people. <laughs> as if it is only black people that has been um, slaves. But if we go back to the 14th and 15th century, the, quint the, the quintessence slave was a white person. So much so that the um, slave comes from the root root word of one of the, Sla of the Slavic countries. So really, if you go back to the 14th, 15th century, the, the quint quintessence slave was really a white person. Um, so if, if, if we can introduce that kind of thinking and that, that kind of teaching in our history, then we become less ashamed that we were slaves, <laughs> that it is slavery isn't unique to black people, even though um, Atlantic slavery was a more extreme form of slavery. I, I agree. Um, so yes, um, in, so all that will be part of repairing the, the psychological damage that has come out of slavery. Thank you so much for that education. Dr. Fulgens, I expect you to continue here. <laughs> Hello. For me, um, thanks, first of all, thanks for having me. For me, the commemoration of emancipation is the commemoration of incompletion. And it was incompletion by design. When we have slavery, Atlantic slavery, if you want to get it down to um, the, the essence of it, the termination of that was not the termination of a status. It was the improvement of a condition to allow for the further dispossession, because for me, slavery and um, colonialism was about dispossession. Dispossession of land, dispossession of person, dispossession of body, dispossession of spirit. Because if you look at the way the African was enslaved and what happened to the African, it was that dispossession. They lost their land, they lost themselves, they lost their, their so There was a, con a structured approach to dispossession and he ended up with the, the black body. Of course, we know psychosomatic, the physical and the, the mental. You have a situation where even today, it hasn't ended. You have a, a perpetuation of these, these acts where people still believe that they're free and in truth and in fact that they're not because emancipation did not bring freedom. Emancipation did not give freedom. The only people who got anything with emancipation were the, the planter class all over the world. Every single emancipation project around the world from the early um, 18th century to 19th century when, when it was completed, early 20th century in Africa, for example, the only people who got anything from, from, the, from emancipation were the people who perpetuated the system. The people who were enslaved got absolutely nothing, and we have a continuation of this dispossession even today. And I hope at some point I think we will be able to connect these histories which lay the foundation for what we have in our society today. That's Dr. King, follow so that. Enkindling our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's the mind, the mindset. And the question is, what is our mindset today? What determines our consciousness today as we sit here? And I want to say thank you for being here and for engaging me in this panel as I sit here. Um, and so when one looks at how do people think the way they think, what drives thoughts, what drives decision making, how does a brain work, how does, how does a brain, how is a brain trained to work, and is our ecosystem nurturing the brains that we believe are conscious and driving the development of themselves, our communities, and our country as we should. 
And when I think about that, and that's what I, I, I think I'm the panel I will spend my time speaking about, um, I think that consciousness or, or history and one's history and a people's history, so your own personal history as well as your people's history, your society's history, is a crucial part in the development of your current consciousness. And many of us are unconscious of our history and therefore unconscious peoples. And so rekindling or, or enkindling our consciousness today is crucial. And for us to do that, we have to know ourselves. And for us to know ourselves, we have to know our history in, in its most blunt, raw, and real state. That's an excellent way for us to segue, Dr. King, because as we go through this panel, the plan is first to look at the history before we delve into the here and now. So I, I want us to get into that. Um, but having been engaged with you, and, and also I need to, to mention um, Dr. Julian Hampson, who's not part of this panel, but who was certainly part of our conversations before, and whose writing, I think, really speaks to what we are going to talk about. So I want to start the discussion from the historical perspective, and then for us to move into the here and now and the solutions. Uh, but there's something that, that in her writing that, that I want to use just to, to, to set off our, our conversation, um, where she speaks about slavery and the roots of landlessness, which Dr. Fulgens and and um, Dr. Anderson alluded to, and she speaks, she says that a century after emancipation, the enduring influence of plantation economics, the ongoing socioeconomic inequalities, and the intergenerational pervasiveness of a sense of political and personal powerlessness is in the here and now of the 21st century. So Dr. Fulgens, I want you to set it off by, by speaking to, to the historical context, which you already started to do, but make us understand the loss that already existed and how it is, well, we'll, we'll focus on the on the now in a bit, but, but give us some historical background to this. It has me to make you understand. I, I put it before you and hopefully <laughs> you, you'll understand. Like I, I said in my, um, when I started, what slavery was is basically about dispossession. And I spoke about the fact that emancipation gave nothing because if you were supposed to be emancipated in the time, because the context of emancipation, people are speaking about human rights because that is the beginning of the conversation about human rights in Western, Western thought. At the same time, you have the project of dispossession being even more insidious. So you emancipate people in 18, 1834, but up until 1838, they still don't own themselves, and they're supposed to continue working for somebody. They don't have the right to own land. It is structured in a manner that they cannot own land. They cannot sell it, they cannot, they cannot um, express their, their spirit in a manner that anybody else can. They must go to certain spaces, churches, to express any kind of connection with, with, with. We are, you know, we're, we're in a situation even in the, 19th, in, in the 20th century when African religions were found, they were supposed to be crushed. Where the practice of African, anything African, was actually illegal, drumming self-expression. So when we speak about slavery, we have to understand it was about ensuring that these people owned nothing, not even themselves, not even their thoughts. So that kind of pressure, if you will, people talk about the beautiful Caribbean space, and it was even beautiful, more beautiful back then, but for me, when I think about it, it's a pressure cooker that was used to make sure whatever came out came out in a specific manner. So we look at our society today, today and we're wondering how could it be what it is. If you understand the previous 350 years, you begin to understand what it meant to be a St. Lucian at that time. And you begin to understand, for example, the, the legacy of violence. But then it was forged in a space of violence. The Caribbean was created by violence. And now, whoa, it's a very violent place. Um, why? Because somebody else is in charge? Or because we are made to believe that we are in charge of it? So I take it all the way back to slavery and the fact that this dispossession was constant, was instrumental, and was systematic. And that, I believe, are legacies that we still inherit and we're still fighting it today. There's an author, I think, in Manjapur, who spoke about the fact that it is, um, we're chasing ghosts. We're chasing ghosts. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to die, right? But the ghost is a spirit that is still restless. 
So we have a lot of ghosts among us, and we're still chasing ghosts, the ghosts of slavery, because slavery is not dead. I, I know you want to follow up on this. As a fellow historian, I, I just can see that you want to jump in. Before we contextualize with Dr. Anderson, you know, view what situation, jump in. Yes, and the reason why I'm jumping in is because of much of what has been said by both Brother Anderson, Brother Winston, and Brother, Brother Stephen, they talk about being blunt, dispossession, and of course, history, and it's the origins of these things. And also, Brother Winston spoke about how to address these things, right? If we're really going to be honest, blunt, and rip the bandage off, we have to go to what gave the right to Europeans mm. to come into indigenous spaces among indigenous people and do the things they did. And by the way, doing it with a conscience that was clear. Now, what clarifies conscience are institutions of religion because when someone believes themselves to be religiously or morally correct they do things without any form of regret or apologies up to today many of these institutions fail to apologize for the institutions of enslaving africans or fail to make the redresses that are necessary so what we have to do then if we're really to be honest about sharing the history is talk about 1493 the year after 1492 when this discovery was said to have taken place in 1493 pope alexander the sixth decided that he was going to have an edict put out a letter that gives the right to portugal and spain to possess whatever lands and whatever were on those lands, whomsoever and whatsoever were, were on those lands, they were going to give them the right to do so. It's a doctrine of theft. Let's be blunt then, Brother Stephen, a doctrine of theft. And therefore, since we're, no, we're not speaking Portuguese or Spanish in St. Lucia, but certainly the empowerment of colonialism came through Portugal as, and, and Spain as first actors, mm -hmm. right? So every other European country, including Britain, including France, which are important to St. Lucia, <laughs> acted with clear consciences in coming into indigenous lands, imposing their will on indigenous people, bringing Africans from Africa, going into Africa also, and imposing that will on the people, on the land, and decidedly up to today to keep the best of the lands and to act with impunity as to what they believe is right because their consciences were clear by the church and particularly the, the Catholic Church. Now mind you, and I'm going a little long, two minutes, but I'll tell you something. In March of 2023, the current Pope of Rome decided that he was going to, on the pressures of indigenous people in Canada, indigenous Americans, Canadian indigenous people, he was visiting Canada at the time, and because they pressured him, he decided to, re what is the, the best term for it is to say he is, he didn't apologize, so he said the he, actions. He regretted the actions. So. Yes. That would be too strong. Decided that it was not consistent with Catholicism, the actions of the past. But he was technically so correct, politically correct, but legally correct, so as not to say enough that would cause a barrage of lawsuits from indigenous Thank people and colonial and uh, current governments, right? So you said, you know, it's not consistent with the church and it's perhaps a regrettable act, but stop short of apologizing. These are the gimmicks, the games, the unfortunate things that consistently permeate our reality. And then you want to look at our current governments and our current systems and say, well, they're not doing enough for the people. They are bonded by law international law established by international institutions, the church, global institutions, 
that many of us, our spirituality is now pegged to those things. So if I criticize the Catholic Church, I am sure we have Catholics right here who are going to take exception to it. And the Anglican Church, which is the Church of England, joined in suit and, and acted. And we have people who are uh, die-hearted, Rasta Mansell, dedicated to that. So we have these problems. We have to go to that as the root and address it from a socio-spiritual reality, consciousness, truth, and reconciliation. I stop there because... And we will come back to that. <laughs> you are watching the Emancipation Panel discussion. When we get back, we contextualize this to our view for the situation. Please stay with us. Do you know me? I've been forced to do this by my trafficker. I was promised a better life, but got forced into domestic servitude. I can be any age. can be any gender, any ethnicity. I am, I am, I am a victim of trafficking in persons. Know the signs, see it, report it. If you see me, please help me. Call the TIP hotline at 847- Welcome back to this education in commemoration of Emancipation 2023. I am here with four panelists, Dr. Ross, Dr. Wayne, I'm getting that right? Dr. Anderson Reynolds, Dr. Winston Fulgens, and Dr. Stephen King. And we had been given some historical context to what we have gone through as a people. Uh, that was quite an education. Um, and we, we had a very animated presentation there from, from um, Ross, Dr. Wayne. And we want to move now to Dr. Anderson Reynolds. Given all what we have heard so far, and I know you are historian yourself but tell us how that feeds through our current situation in the town of, of Viewfort. Yes I'll, I'll begin where Winston left off. He mentioned dispossession mm -hmm. as a, one of the features of slavery but what is what he alluded to but he didn't go he didn't go into specifics was that after emancipation the, the plantocracy along with the government took specific definite steps <laughs> to keep the former slaves dispossessed so that they can continue getting a cheap source of labor for their plantations. So they took a number of steps. Um, they taxed horses and other means of transportation. They, they, they set crown, the price of crown land arbitrarily high and increased the minimum acreage size that the former slaves could, could purchase land. In some territories like Barbados and the, and the US, they, in, they passed the, um, uh, what do you call it, fragrancy laws. So any um, black person they found that seemed idle, they um, imprisoned them and loaned them out to plantations. Um, they imposed, um, now, the, the slaves, because, because St. Lucia is very mountainous, um, the slaves could, could um, go up in the hills and cultivate what is called marginal lands. So in other words, the, the former slaves could find ways to survive without money. So, so to prevent that, they, they went and they, they set specific taxes so that this, to, to force these people to go work <laughs> on the plantations so that, because they will need the money to pay the taxes. All this was part of keeping the um, former slaves dispossessed, making sure um, that the plantations continue getting a, 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 cheap, a cheap source of labor. Now, in terms of Beaufort, what I've just, just described there, it is in Beaufort, it became the most extreme in terms of the 
of the welfare of the former slaves. Because unlike uh, most other, many other parts of the country, you fought it relatively flat. So that means the plantations, that the green slavery, the plantations occupied the totality of the land space. So the blacks in Beaufort could not find um, what is called marginal lands in which to cultivate. So they were more totally dependent on the plantations. So after slavery, they, were, they still remained totally dependent on the plantations because there, were, there, was, there was no extra land, marginal lands to cultivate. So if they didn't work for the um, sugar factory and the plantations, they would have had to go fishing and get into charcoal production and so forth. So, so what we should remember is that during slavery, sugar plantation, the Vufort lands was to, totally occupied by the um, sugar factories. In the mid-30s, um, the factories closed down. But instead of the land being distributed to the former slaves, it was sold to a bad, Barbadian um, um, scheme where well, 2,000 Barbadians came to, to, est to establish, to, to keep the sugar factory running, where each of the 2,000 Barbadians would receive five acres of land to plant, plant sugar cane for the um, factories. And what, what about the Jufortians? Well, <laughs> they, wouldn't, they wouldn't get land, but they will remain as workers for the, for the so then, in other words, they were dispossessed. They remained dispossessed. But in the middle of that bad Indian scheme, World War II came. So what happened? The, Brit um, the British sold the whole of Beaufort, or at least the whole of Beaufort, to the Americans for, for destroyers. So again, the whole of Beaufort was totally um, occupied by the Americans, so there was still no land for Beaufortians to have. Okay, um, World War II came to a close. But the lands were at least belonged to the Americans, so Beaufortians couldn't was wasn't free to take over the land. Um, okay, then um, I think the George Charles government was able to secure the land from the um, from the Americans, but the, the land became crown lands, government lands, still not available to Beaufortians for for use. And then after that, what you had was one, the lands were, be, were basically set aside for large scale projects, the last of which was DSH. So here we have Euphorians landless, but the, the, best of, the best of the lands is reserved for large scale project um, enterprises, most of which are externally determined and usually by foreign entities. So today, we are in a situation where most of the lands in Beaufort Town itself is owned by the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church and Crown Lands. <coughs> Many of the people that occupy lands in Beaufort build their homes. They, they, they cannot have title to the land because the land belongs to one of those um, churches. So for the most part, Beaufort has remained landless. But imagine emancipation the slaves didn't own anything. They are kept dispossessed. So what you have is a shiftless population trying to um, take root, but don't have no means and so forth. So let's get to Bruceville. Bruceville resembles um, St. Lucia just after slavery. What you have is a bunch of people, they don't own the land, they are shiftless, they don't own the land, they are in a state of, they are in the same state of dispossession as were the former slaves um, just after emancipation. So, so what, does, what was the main difference between slavery, a slave, and a slave master? Well, ownership, ownership of yourself, ownership of land, ownership of the factors of, of production. Mm -hmm. So here we are in Beaufort, to the extent that Beaufortians don't own land, don't own the means of production, are unskilled, don't have marketable skills, is to the extent 
that they are slaves because if we define slavery based on ownership of yourself and ownership of land, if you don't quite own yourself because you have no marketable skills um, and so forth, and you don't own any of the factors of production, then to that extent you, you are slave. And that translates to a powerlessness. That, well, that is what I'm hearing. Powerlessness, um, um, people not empowered. That, that, that seems to be ingrained. Who wants to jump in here to well, My difficulty yeah. with emancipation and the fact that it needs to be commemorated, I mean, that's what I'm asking. We, we need to turn this ship around. We need to celebrate emancipation. Emancip if you look at emancipation, in the way it's presented, it's supposed to be where you free people. But emancipation, as we commemorated, did not free anybody. A free person has the right to own land, or has access to land. A free person has owning their body. A free person has access to education. A free person has the right to vote, the right to self-determination. In St. Lucia, the right to vote came in 1951 and 1952. That's 100 how many years past slavery. So when I speak about the fact that emancipation gave nothing to the people who were enslaved, that's what I'm talking about. Because if emancipation, within the framework presented by, by European thought, is the freeing of people who were enslaved, the project has failed and continues to fail. And that's why I'm saying the ghost, emancipation is the ghost of slavery. Slavery was never killed, and we're still chasing that. The notion of the right to vote is so farcical in the Caribbean. And it's someone who wrote it, the name forgets, um, slips in right now, about the, col the col coloniality of Caribbean ex existence. The fact that the right to vote really is not a right to vote. You go, you cast a ballot, but you, we can have another conversation on that. Mm -hmm. Access to land. What do you have to put up to get access to land? So um, the argument, so my thing is we need to start reframing this emancipation to start to see a way to building citizens. But I want, us to, I want to challenge you for us to do that now because I think from the perspective that we have grown up with, we celebrated it because we saw it as something that the slaves did. They fought for their freedom. I think that's what we have been schooled for the last how many years. I think that, that, that is a reaction to the, how do you call it, the Wilberforceization of emancipation, where the great white man freed. So in Caribbean historiography, the pushback was black people fought for it. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, yes, Wilberforce and his guys did his things, but I think in the conversation about emancipation, that act that was passed, we forget that there were actually black people who were involved and initiated the conversation about not just emancipation, the freeing of black people. Black people. And when you read about them, you're shocked. A guy who left a plantation in Jamaica and goes to work on the docks in England and he riles up dock workers and begins to ask questions and begins to demand things like the right to vote before the British Parliament starts talking about slavery. And after, I mean, we could go on and on, and we could go on forever, because now we have the information to start the education and to reframe what this thing was. Because if we reframe it in a manner that we begin to put ourselves, we begin to understand, Anderson spoke about the fact that um, we need to go, out, go back to ancient civilizations. I am saying that is necessary and that is wonderful, but we have enough the diaspora, the African diaspora has enough capital, intellectual capital to show that it was a force to lead to that emancipation as well. But the thing is, the history is not accessible to everyone. I could, I try to do a lot of reading on it, and I think it has allowed me to understand a lot of things, and I try to speak on it. But it's, it's a little difficult now to pull that from the ivory tower and spread it among the people, because what's the avenue? People say, oh, we need to teach history in schools, but how much can you teach a 12-year-old? The gravitas of this thing, I think we need to start thinking about how we move with it, because we could parcel it and allow it to permeate for the rest of the society, but there has to be a reframing of thought, a reframing of self, a claiming, because remember, we got nothing, a claiming of everything that was taken from in a manner that allows us to continue building ourselves, because we're standing on the shoulders of giants 
a lot of people of African descent, of, of the African diaspora, and even Africans themselves who are involved in this process who haven't gotten the, um, the, the kudos for what they did. So my argument here is a, a reframing of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the historian will argue that there was a time when the Caribbean was the center of European thought and civilization, and now we're on the periphery. It's because of how the story is being told. We need to take that over. We need to take it back. We need to repossess it. I'm sorry I'm using the word possess and dispossess so often, but for me, that is what it is, a repossession uh, of what was taken because nothing has ever been given, even after a massive dispossession over centuries. I, I want you to stay along the lines of reframing of thought and of self, Dr. King, in terms of the work that that has been done at V4, in terms of what you're seeing there, because you want to make that the center of our conversation. How do you see that working in a, in a space, as we have already established, where everything was taken away, where it was just a state or military, um, and we're still saying that these people are dispossessed? How do how do we rekindle that, that fervor um, to drive our people to do for themselves? or to get government if that if that is what it takes. Before we get to how, we have to understand what has been happening. So listening to the panelists, you hear very clearly that there are two main psychopathological forces that have been inflicted on people, our people, especially view for people. Is the inequality, gross inequality, which speaks to the fact that you don't have land, you don't have ownership of yourself, you don't have ownership of means of production, you don't have ownership of your social or economic mobility. That is massive inequality. In social science, inequality is highly correlated with um, s significant um, violence, significant um, issues of poor decision making, poor life choices, it's a, it's a, there's a whole psychopathology. To explain how that happens, you have to look at, at trauma, psychological trauma. Now when we spoke about history, we talk about, um, if I speak about complex psychological trauma, which means here we have history of significant trauma that has been described, that is actually passed on to generations. That's intergenerational. How? Because trauma creates stress in a brain. Stress causes a, a body reaction. That body reaction becomes imprinted in how cells function because human beings are ecological. They respond to their environment. You, s we have to stop. You, have, you stress a body, it will imprint. The response will imprint because the, 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 the being will need to know how to respond best. That phenomenon is passed on. So you have people that are born with a sensitivity to respond to stress. You further stress them because you've kept them powerless and dispossessed. You will further stress them. What that does, a stress reaction in a, in a human being, causes you to shut down your higher functions and deal with impulsive, um, the impulsive reaction, which is short term, bounce and draw. I must respond now for now. I'm not thinking strategically. I'm thinking immediate, because I must survive now over a threat that is coming to me. A brain does not differentiate which trauma is coming. It just has a reaction. But you know what's even more interesting, Natalie, to me as well? Is that that same chronic stress causes chronic immune suppression and chronic metabolic dysregulation and hormonal dysregulation, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, autoimmune disorders. In other words, this ecological system that, we, that has persisted from history right through till today and kept people in that chronic stress state has also kept them in a, in a state where they cannot be truly conscious, they cannot be truly empowered, and they get sick physically, mentally, and socially sick. And that is the legacy that you are hearing sp spoken about here. And with that background, we can then begin to talk about what we now need to do. And we will talk about that when we come back to continue this panel discussion in commemoration of Emancipation 2023. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. Imagine being away from home, surrounded by danger and hostility, unable to escape or speak the language, and being exploited. It might sound like fiction, but for 40 million victims of human trafficking worldwide, it is a reality. 
Innocent people are enticed by the promise of a new life, then enslaved into forced labor or sex trafficking. Human trafficking happens in plain sight. Know the signs, see it, report it. To report suspected cases of human trafficking, call the TIB hotline at 847. Welcome back to this panel discussion as we dis as we look at emancipation 2023 and the historical impact of slavery and the landlessness issue that we face, the dispossession issue that we face, particularly in the area of Vufort. Today I am accompanied by four panelists in the persons of Dr. Raswain, Dr. Anderson Reynolds, Dr. Winston Fulgens, and Dr. Stephen King. And we have really looked at the historical legacy um, that confronts us and we want now to move to what can be done. Um, we, we can't stay, for me, in, in the state of um, what has been. Uh, we really need to find ways for us to move forward. And, and gentlemen, I, I want to sort of challenge you to see a number of things. Um, a question that was posed is, is, how can we facilitate awareness of that process to change the paradigm of, of citizens' land ownership? If we can start there, because we allude to that, that, that disposition. Um, so what, what roles can we play to ensure that, that do, those injustices, that we somehow are able to reform those? Uh, Doctor, well, let me start with you and from a Caribbean perspective. Yes, give thanks. You know, so one of the things that brought me into St. Lucia uh, and activity I was involved, I've been involved with and, and continue to be involved in is, is a justice and healing initiative. And it was not targeted outside of ourselves. It was to look at ourselves as a family, both as a St. Lucian family and then within the context of the broader Caribbean and then the broader black spaces to say we need our own reconciliation with self. We need forgiveness among ourselves because we have done some things. We have perpetuated the wrongs that have been brought on us, the trauma on ourselves. We have shared it with each other and we continue to do those abuses. As Brother Stephen King said, it becomes a psychosis. So the first thing is really to be able to uncover that, take that from under the rug and then say to our own Caribbean governments who are now carrying forward the vestiges of colonial uh, the negative components of colonialism and continue to articulate and share that and make it part of the reality of our people. To say to these governments, within the Caribbean or CARICOM spaces, we need to take a stand, right, in terms of justice for our people, ourselves. We're no longer going to say, as a raster man, to say, fire burn upon the government and the prime minister and the politicians. We're saying, let us all come together and unpack this thing and find some solutions because we, we know how to, you know. All of us are problem solvers in industries and in so, so many different spaces. Yet we cannot do it for the family, for ourselves. Internally, we cannot do it because we are afraid to address the elephant in the room. One, it starts with religion and how we have been we have been oriented. Mind you, spirituality is all part of our reality, of our being. But the way we express it and the loyalties that comes through it needs to be broken down and overstood completely. So we don't need to be loyal to a pope or to a church name, space, or, or, or whatever it is. We need to be truthful within humanity. Emperor Haile Selassie I says we must ultimately owe our allegiance, not to nation states, but to our fellow man, starting with the individual. Brother Winston, I owe my allegiance to you and Brother, 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 <laughs> brother Anderson and Brother Stephen, because I'm going to tell you the truth. And it will sting, it should, because we have been traumatized for so long that we don't realize that this is what is really happening. So when we stop using the term slave as a noun, and we start saying, our people are enslaved, but my ancestors were doctors. That's why I'm one today. Let us face that, because if generational trauma is real, then generational excellence is also real. Oh, yeah. Right? So my people who were enslaved were doctors. And so were all of your, 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 your people because I am my ancestor. Right? 
And let us then stop saying slaves as we did last year when we went into the schools. We said, don't you? Describe for me what comes to your mind when someone says slave. And every student said a black man. Not recognizing, as you correctly said, Brother Winston, that it is part of, Brother Anderson also, it is part of the evolution of humanity. But of course, our trauma is recent and so atrocious. So the first things then, so I will be sure, is, to, is the use of language. Brother Winston said, change a ship. It's the first way to, to do that if you believe the Bible as I use it for my benefit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and made God. So God is the Word. Our words then can bring life. So the first thing we start saying, my people were not slaves. As a noun, they were enslaved as bodies. And then we start going through all the other words that keeps our psychosis in a space of enslavement and as the right honor of Marcus Garvey says, emancipate ourselves from that mentality because only ourselves can free our minds. Give thanks. Give thanks. And Dr. King, as he, as he speaks to, to that, um, in the importance of language, and we, we talk about the slave mentality um, in St. Lucia, that, that's a, a phrase that I've heard used here, uh, and we talk about the, 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 so the psychosocial importance. Uh, what are your solutions? Yeah, and I go full circle when we speak about the consciousness, because what, what Ross Dr. Wayne Rose there mentioned is the consciousness, mm -hmm. raising that consciousness, which starts with speaking the words of empowerment and positivity to yourself. Mm -hmm. Because that your, your, the human brain is neuroplastic. Mm -hmm. it, can, it can be morphed. No matter, there's no such thing as a, a burned mind. No mind is burnt, okay? So every mind can be reprogrammed, and you can reprogram your brain. We now do, need to create spaces for our children and our people to start to unpack and reprogram their minds, learn how to cope, learn how to understand options that they may have that they did not see before, learn that they have the right to exercise those options, they have the power to exercise those options, and it's our job to hold their hand if necessary or show them where they can go to get those resources so they can have that social and economic mobility that they, that they truly desire. So that, that needs to happen. Now that happens in what we, well, we call them safe spaces. Because a safe space, when you have a traumatized individual, psychological trauma, you need a safe space. You need a place they can come where they can trust people and they can feel comfortable so they can let their guard down, their vulnerabilities can show, and then they can start to articulate their, 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 their traumas. And then they can begin to heal. Because you can't heal unless you articulate it. Right? Word. Word. So that's what, for instance, a resource center does. That's why we talk about a resource center in Beaufort, for instance, as one solution, creating a space. But it's not, a, it's not like Bunny Wheeler says, um, it's not, he says, you know, Babylon, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a physical space, it's a mental space. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to get to. So even in their home, they, their minds become a safe space now for themselves and their children. Next place, so next solution, schools. Schools. <laughs> schools are a powerful place that could be a safe space, a trauma-sensitive space where our children can come and they can now, um, again, unpack. They can be vulnerable, they can express themselves, and we have teachers and counselors and other adults and mentors who can support those children. The volunteers that can come in, Winston, myself, Anderson, Raswell, help them. Help them to, to, to be the powerful beings that they have that potential to be, because every child has that potential. But we need to create that mindset, right? And that's, so schools can do that. The other place, of course, is our government. I told the Prime Minister the other day, every policy coming to you should have on the top of it, how is this going to reduce inequality in our country? or in our community or wherever. Because every policy of government, the only role of government that I see is to reduce inequality in the country. That's why we come together and create a government, fund the government with a budget, with a set of money to do just that, to set a balance, to create opportunity for people to have access to land, access to business, access to jobs. 
access to their, their means of production, whatever that may be. That is what I see. The other thing is, of course, perhaps we said it, business community and all of us in the society must come together. The, the siege mentality, the us and them mentality has to go. This is a community, a unity. We must come together, hold hands together. Why? Because when you reduce inequality, not only do we make people more productive, we make more money flow in the country, we make the country develop. We as business people do better. Our current businesses do better when we reduce the inequality. And that's, that is an economic as well as a social science fact. So these are some of the things that I see we as a St. Lucian people can do. Thank you. And Dr. Fulgens, you said earlier um, about just teaching history to a 12-year-old, but, but we see the power of education and of schools, as, as Dr. King said. How do you think we can revolutionize our education system to facilitate that mindset change that I think we are, we are referring to here? Schools have been one of the places where the tools of colonialism and slavery actually were really, really forged and implemented. And I think is a place that we can actually re start reversing the process. Teaching of school of history in schools, starting from young. You don't have to understand the great forces of dispossession, if you will, but you begin to understand where you came from, what your role has been, that you were a person, that the negative image you see on TV every time you see a person who looks like you, that's not actually real that there are people who look like you have done great things and continue to great, do great things. And you begin to see yourself as capable of doing great things. So I'm saying, you start teaching the history, uh, baby steps, and eventually you get to the higher level and so on and so forth. So after this community college should be teaching history. I think, well, if we do it once, we do it in with one course where you can graduate without doing that history, but there should be more options with history. So right through the system, we should be teaching people history, the history of the diaspora, history of America, um, when I say America, I'm not talking about the U.S., I'm talking about the, uh, that, that, that space. And um, even Africa, Mother Africa, if you will, because I, uh, something struck me some time ago. I wouldn't say where, I, where and what I was doing. The only continent in the world that actually has a female gender is Africa. And I'm wondering what it has to do with anything, including that fifth famous wall that um, has been part of, that has been injected into our culture, if you will. But I will leave that there, and that's a conversation for a different time. This is certainly a different panel discussion. Yeah. Um, and as we round up, Dr. Anderson, you get to situate this in, in your own constituency. What are the thoughts that have been shared here today? How could you see that impacting the town of G14? Yes, of course, um, the gentleman has um, have covered a, a lot of what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. so, so I'll just go straight to G14 mm -hmm. and what I proposed recently that we need a Marshall Plan for report. And I don't know if everybody is acquainted with the Marshall Plan. That was a plan the US put in operation to resuscitate Europe after, after the World War. Europe was in, was in a crumbles, and the US spent billions of dollars resuscitating Europe and Japan. Um, I think in areas like default, the, the socio-economic conditions there are a key to a catas catastrophe that has happened. Um, Post-war, um, we are facing post-war conditions. For example, um, Beaufort faces the highest unemployment rate in the country, um, like 30-something um, uh, um, percent unemployment rate. Um, Beaufort is the third poorest district, um, and as you can see, and we have, take, take, we have taken note of the crime, the spike in crime. Um, some people would think say Beaufort is like the, the drug capital of, 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 of the island. And Beaufort is being talked about as a failed state. So the same conditions, similar conditions that obtain um, after, in the aftermath of a war, you have it in Beaufort. So, so I think we need nothing less than a Marshall Plan. We need to get about 300 billion US dollars and introduce serious socio-economic programs for Beaufort, both um, not just um, physical development, but as um, Dr. King has been expressing, social programs, educational programs, cultural programs, 
sporting programs and also creating em employment. We need serious employment activities, so we really need a Marshall Plan for view Fort. Gentlemen, our time is almost up. I really want to thank you for being here, but I just want to give you just 30 seconds for some closing thoughts as we end our panel discussion for the commemoration of Emancipation 2023. Yes, so give thanks um, for the opportunity again to share with the St. Lucian family. Uh, this, these issues are very um, important and dear to us, all of us, and this is why I'm here in St. Lucia. Uh, I want to thank the Ubuntu Cultural Center and its initiatives that seeks to address these specific issues um, of injustice, of healing within the family, and of finding solutions uh, to the challenges that are facing St. Lucia, Viewfoot, and the larger Caribbean community. Uh, what uh, I will commit to is my own will to work and certainly to make a difference in whatever small ways. And so I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Uh, we have a SEEDS project that is launched in Viewfort for the specific purposes of addressing some of these challenges. We know that it's a drop in the bucket to a Marshall Plan, but certainly what, it's, what it represents is intention. And so uh, we have a collective who are inten intentional about addressing these challenges. We ask people to join us. They can join by, by virtue of linking with the famous Dr. King. But there are others. All of us who are here are committed to that process. And I want to just thank you again for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Yes, in terms of emancipation, I, I think um, I think what we all have been discussing is about how do we go about repairing the damage um, than um, um, by slavery, colonialism, and so forth. How do we go about repairing that damage? And there are, we have been listing different means and approaches. So we look forward to that being, that seed growing big fruit in view fort. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Fordred? Um, for me, um, whenever I have a mic, I speak about and shout about the fact that we should be teaching history in our schools. I think that is how we start the process because the child taught one level will grow up and eventually be an adult who starts, to, who becomes a minister, who becomes a lawyer, who becomes a doctor, who becomes somebody of influence who understands what their role is and what their responsibilities are to the society that they're growing up in. So, um, yeah, well, commitment, that's, that's my part. For me, I think, as I close, I want to thank people of you for it. Here's why I want to thank them. At our last mediation session, when we had all the communities together talking, in the Southwest Community College Conference Room, in fact, um, I, want to, I told them that the future of St. Lucia should be spearheaded by Viewfort, the tip of the spear. Why? Viewfort has been the first in so many things, and Viewfort can be the first in the transformation that is necessary. And they, they agreed. They said, and I wanted to commend them for their faith and their courage, because it takes great faith and great courage to after 13 people have been murdered, for communities to say, okay, enough is enough, we will stop. And we will commit to a, a transformative future. That, I don't know if people who are listening to this can understand how deep and powerful that is when, a, when people can do that. Most of us don't have to face those kinds of things. Okay, so I just want to thank them, and I want to thank them in advance. I'm thanking them in advance for the, when we see, and St. Lucia sees how Viewfort can rise and what Viewfort can do. And that's what I'm looking forward to. And so far, so good. Thank you so much for joining us here today as we commemorated Emancipation 2023 with a panel discussion of 
I would say four intellectuals who really educated us on the, the legacy of, of slavery and, and how we can change our thinking and they really, really enkindled our consciousness. I hope your consciousness was ignited today and I ask you to reach out to all those who are trying to make a difference in Viewfort. Happy in Emancipation Celebration. Although I was told it's not a celebration, but let us fight for ourselves. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.